Here's a sampling from author George Cavanaugh's It's the Smile, Chapter 1. If you'd like to hear more from this author or read more of his work, please visit his website at marmot.com. The Smile by George Cavanaugh. Her smile melted him. He was barrel-chested, hands as big as bear paws, tough enough to whip any two men in the country, and had proved it more than once. Not a hairy man, as some men are, but arms as big as tree trunks. If there ever was an actual alley-oop, it would be him. Blue eyes and blonde hair showed his Viking ancestry. Square-cut jaw and high cheekbones on a head looking as though it was chiseled from a block of granite, reminiscent of his Cherokee ancestry. Skin was not quite Mexican brown, but darker than most Europeans, and almost having a red tint to it, again thanks to his ancestry. With arms like trunks and legs like stumps, he was just a solid man. Yancey's paw was full-blood Viking, and his maw was a full-blood Cherokee. A quiet man, possessive of strength both physically and mentally as well as emotionally. But he had never been whipped. That is, until he was conquered with the smile. And that's what he called it, the smile. The first time he saw her, he was midway through a pugilistic battle with a couple of his favorite opponents. His skin rippled and bunched as the muscle, tendon, and pure old brawn worked mightily beneath it. Sweat coursed in sheets down his brawny torso. In the bright, hot noon sunlight of the midsummer day, He shone as if illuminated from the inside with the fury of the gods. From somewhere in his brain, the distinct tapping of a petite woman's footfall on the wooden walkway in front of the saloon, just a few feet from where the ring had been built, caught his attention. The ring had been deliberately positioned so as to give the greatest view from four directions, being right in the middle of the cross streets of Main Street and Mangle. Main Street ran true north and south, with only a few cross streets on either side of Mangle, it being the main cross street. Mangle Street had been so named when a hearse, behind a team of sleek runaway blacks, spooked by the gunfire of a drunk celebrating the strike of a quite profitable gold stake. One of the shots creased the back of the first black and cut a gash along the hip of another. In a heartbeat, the blacks had reached full gallop and out of control. Galloping full out, they collided with a wagon parked in front of the general store from which the owner was filling next week's bill of staples. The result was a mangled mess of splintered wood, blood, and guts of the once beautiful team of blacks, busted glass, and a busted coffin, nice for that day and age, and an already laid-out dead man lying face down in the dust, his backless suit laying bare the full view of his entire backside. Nasty scene. It wouldn't have been so bad, except this course was one of the town founders. A preacher who had been shot while giving some extracurricular counsel and consoling to the bar owner's wife. But it was an event that marked a spot on the timeline of the little city. When someone would speak of an event or a location, they used this particular incident as a reference point. Eventually, it was shortened for sake of conversation to just mangle. It was purported that someone wanted to name the junction relating to bare backs, open cabooses. You know how some are quite sure to make use of the situation with a joke. It was finally settled to be named Mangle Street. Now folks in that neck of the woods would use it as a timeline. Were you here before or after mangle? would be a common question to determine the date of your arrival to town. The same for giving directions, such as, Buck's house is the second red on the right, just north of Mangle. It was not a huge town, probably under a thousand, but it was growing exponentially as typical of mining towns in the 1850s in the hills just below Sonora. Towns such as this were laid out hastily. Buildings at first were merely tents. Watering holes were sometimes nothing but a rail to which one would hitch their horse. They were open and most usually a set of sawhorses with rough sawn planks over them served as the bar, 
The tent would come later. The gurgling, pure, and cold mountain streams which drained off the newly melted snow into the valley below were constant battles of thievery, murder, mayhem, and other debauchery as was found in the days of men chasing that ever-elusive and fast-disappearing substance called gold. Every man in the stream had dreams of making it big on his labor. Men on the sides of the streams hoped to make it big on the labors of those in the streams. But there was gold. Men fought over it. Men killed for it. Men gambled for it. Men slaved and toiled in the icy waters, hours on end, panning, moving, digging for it. Their bodies grew numb in the frigid water as they tried just one more pan. Yancey would make more in a day doing what he dearly loved than most miners made in a week. And usually, the fight only lasted till his opponent or him was KO'd. But Yancey had never been beat. But the fights of Yancey Gale had for a time grown boring, as watchers all knew who was going to win. Yancey would take his time in knocking some unfortunate bruiser out, honing his skills at dodging, ducking, blocking, fainting, moving, sneaking a little pat or thump in on his opponents, usually angering them more than anything. And he took his share of blows, too, some of which would knock a less powerful receiver into next week. But his trade, bare fisticuffs, his one true love, the pugilistic battle had a turnaround when someone suggested he fight two men. Yancey was in his prime once more, and he challenged one and all to their chance in the ring with him. However, that nearly came to a screeching halt when he accepted a challenge to fight three men, huge bruisers known well in the streets of Frisco as thugs. Halfway during the fight, one of the men, seeing they were going to lose the fight, pulled a shank from his waistband and swung at Yancey. Yancey caught the glint of the sun on the steel and swung with all his might at the man, killing him instantly by breaking his neck. The other two guys promptly walked away. With plenty of witnesses to vouch for him, Yancey was let off by the sheriff because of self-defense. The sheriff knew Yancey well but warned him if he killed someone else, he could be charged with murder. From then on, it was kept down to a battle of two to one. On this day, Yancey, having been distracted by the dainty footfalls on the boardwalk, was rudely brought back to his present activity by a slam to the head as his opponent, the big old bruiser named German, seeing a chance for a sucker punch, promptly took advantage of and used the opportunity to step into a good roundhouse punch, landing it with a good wallop that cracked like the sound of a whip. Any other man would have been knocked unconscious or killed. It rang Yancey's bell heavily, but he merely shook his head and out of nothing but mere survival, came up with an uppercut, catching German under his chin, never even actually aiming. He was still distracted by the sound of the tapping, which had now stopped. The fighter's head snapped back, and he fell like a limp rag to the ground, never to fight again. German was dead. Yancey turned his attention to the other opponent, only to see the man grab the towel he had been using, bloody from the bout, and threw it into the ring to signify he was through. From somewhere, the tapping of the angel he had seen paused, and from the elevated walkway of the Strawberry Hotel, she was looking straight at him. When he paused in the midst of the fight, she had also, and their eyes had locked. That's the moment she had melted him with the smile. Everything around him ceased to exist. It was quiet. He heard nothing. All he could see was the little circle of tunnel vision, and within it was the most beautiful face he'd ever seen. On it was the smile. Now he knew what an angel looked like. He lost all interest in his current battle and his opponent's. Gone also was the sense of the heat from the rays beating down on him from the increasing sun now marching past midday. In his state of mind, he was vulnerable to attack from any direction. He was unaware even in the fact that he had just killed a man. And when he had felled German, she turned her back on him and walked away. He came to his senses only when he heard the click of the big forty-five already leveled at his chest. 
It was the sheriff that spoke. Okay, Yancey, he said in a low, steady voice. I'm going to have to take you in and lock you up till we have a trial. The crowd was quiet as a church mouse at the scene unfolding in front of them. This was getting better by the moment. The sheriff paused a second and then added, But I don't want to shoot you. Because, Yancey, me and you is friends, and you voted for me to be sheriff as well as most of the yahoos in this crowd. And by cracky, I'm going to do my job despite of it. But if you make the wrong move, I'll drop you where you stand. The older man, known for his solitude and no-nonsense character, had been a favorite with everybody around town to be sheriff, except with the corrupt and crooked lever bunch. Arthur Randall, known for his level head, had been sheriff even before Mangle. Yancey stood there, not quite understanding what was happening to him, still under the influence of the smile. Never before had anyone affected him so. Okay, Sheriff, let's go. And Yancey simply turned on his heel and headed for the Sheriff's office. He gave a question look as to German laying on the ground. He headed through the door, flinging it open so violently that it slammed against the wall loudly. The deputy, asleep behind the desk, was alarmed awake and raking his spurs across the wood of the desk, stood up quickly, clumsily slapping leather. He had been leaning back in the chair with his boots on the heavy oak table serving as a desk and was so startled had jumped up quickly reaching for his gun. It was a common term which was just another shortened sentence used at that time. Many such terms were used and eventually became the official language of the cowboy era. Most of the men to come into the town were ex-cowpokes and most carried guns. When one went for his gun, he slapped leather. But as slow as he was, he'd have been dead in an instant had the threat been real. Yancey didn't even waste a second look on the Barney Fife deputy of Strawberry. He'd been placed into the position by paid votes, compliments of the Lever clan. Sheriff Randall did not know he was actually a grandson of Buck Lever, but he did know he was a plant. Had Yancey been in a bad mood, he would have merely slapped the gun out of the deputy's hand and then slapped him silly, probably breaking the kid's neck in the process. Yancey just ignored him and headed for the cell, not really knowing what the charge was. Sheriff Randall did not like the deputy either, but the kid was the deputy. Randall knew if it were ever to come down to a stand-up gunfight, the novice would fold and run. He also knew that he was doing what he was placed in the position to do, report on the inner happenings of the sheriff's office. Going by the name of Manny, he never introduced himself as to his last name. Buck Lever had seen to that and had given him warning what would happen if someone ever learned he was actually a Lever. So if asked, he would give the name Osborne, and it stuck. The name of Osborne would be used for the rest of his life, although in later years he would use more than one alias. Sheriff Randall sniffed his disgust at the deputy and noticed the mud on his boots and the same mud on the desk. His look of disgust rankled with the deputy, but even then he didn't take the time to wipe the desk off before slamming the door on the way out. The sheriff casually walked over to the wall behind the desk, retrieved the big ring of keys from the wooden peg where they hung. The door hinges creaked loudly as they complained of years without oil. The heavy door clanked loudly as it slammed home and the locked barrel slid to and chocked. The heavy iron gate was to the only cell of which the little jail boasted. Yancey was already lying down with his face to the wall. Dinner bell in an hour, Yancey, he said to the big man in the cell. I'll have some water brought in so you can wash up. Here's your shirt. He hung the big worn shirt on one of the crossbars and clumped across the room to the chair in front of the desk. Using an old cloth, he raked the mud off onto the floor, then wiped the desk carefully. The keys tinkled lightly as the sheriff unlocked the top drawer of the big desk. From a treasured pile of rough-cut paper, he pulled a sheet and laid it on the smoothest part of the desk. He carefully sharpened his quill, dipped it into the well, and began to record what he knew of the incident. He was a nice hand in the art of writing, not fancy, but very readable. 
It didn't matter too much, as he was only one of two or three people in these hereabouts what could read and write. He treasured that and spent idle time writing his name over and over in the solitude of winter months riding fences honing his skills. He came slowly with no one to teach since the teacher left. A few students he was forced to relocate. Sheriff Randall sat back from the desk. The not-too-stable chair groaned as he leaned back. He studied all he knew of the situation and had a notion that his helping of the big man in the cell would come back to him some day. Again and again, he would experience firsthand that old saying from the Bible that, You reap what you sow. The seeds he was planting in the helping of Nancy Gale would certainly spring forth to be a great asset, but it would be years in coming.